Section 9 of Your Mind and How to Use It by William Walker Atkinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 The Intellect. The class of mental states or processes grouped together under the name of intellectual processes formed a second great division of the mental states, the two others being feeling and will, respectively. Intellect has been defined as follows, the part or faculty of the human mind by which it knows, as distinguished from the power to feel and to will, the thinking faculty, the understanding, also as that faculty of the human mind by which it receives or comprehends the ideas communicated to it by the senses or the perception or other means, as distinguished from the power to feel and to will the power or faculty to perceive objects in their relations, the power to judge and comprehend, also the capacity for higher forms of knowledge as distinguished from the power to perceive and imagine. In the preceding chapters we have seen that the individual is able to experience sensations in consciousness, and that he is able to perceive them mentally, the latter being the first step in intellectual activity. We have also seen that he is able to reproduce the perception by means of memory and imagination, and that, by means of the latter, he is able to recombine and rearrange the objects of perception. We have also seen that he has what are known as feelings, which depend upon his previous experience and that of his progenitors. So far, the mind has been considered merely as a receiving and reproducing instrument with the added attachment of the recombining power of the imagination. Up to this point, the mind may be compared to the phonographic cylinder, with an attachment capable of recombining its recorded impressions. The impressions are received and perceived, are stored away, are reproduced, and, by the use of the imagination, are recombined. Up to this point, the mind is seen to be more or less of an automatic instinctive faculty. It may be traced from the purely reflex activity of the lowest forms of life up through the lower animals, step by step, until a very high degree of mental power is perceived in animals like the horse, dog, or elephant. But there is something lacking. There is missing that peculiar power of thinking in symbols and abstract conceptions which distinguishes the human race, and which is closely bound up with the faculty of language or expressing thoughts in words. The comparatively high mental process of the lower animals is dwarfed by the human faculty of thinking, and thinking is a manifestation of the intellect. What is it to think? Strange to say, very few persons can answer this question correctly at first. They find themselves inclined to answer the inquiry in the words of the child. Why, to think, is to think. Let us see if we can make it plain. The dictionary definition is a little too technical to be of much use to the beginner, but here it is. To employ any of the intellectual powers except that of simple perception through the senses. But what are the intellectual powers so employed, and how are they employed? Let us see. Stating the matter plainly in common terms, we may say that thinking is the mental process of one, comparing our perceptions of things with each other, noting the points of likeness and of difference, two, classifying them according to the ascertained likeness or difference, and thus tying them up in mental bundles with each set of things of a kind in its own bundle, three, forming the abstract symbolic mental idea, concept of each class of things so grouped that we may afterward use as we use figures in mathematical calculations. 4. Using these concepts in order to form inferences, that is, to reason from the known to the unknown and to form judgments regarding things. 5. Comparing these judgments and deducing higher judgments from them, and so on. Without thinking, man will be dependent upon each particular experience for his knowledge, except so far as memory and imagination could instinctively aid him. 
by thought processes he is enabled to infer that if certain things be true of one of a certain kind of things the same thing may be expected from others of the same class as he is able to note points of likeness or difference he is able to form clearer and truer inferences in addition he is able to apply his constructive imagination to the rearrangement and recombination of things whose nature he has discovered and thus progress along the line of material achievement as well as of knowledge it must be remembered however that the intellect depends entirely for its material upon the perception which in turn receives its raw material from the senses the intellect merely groups together the material of perception makes inferences draws conclusions from and forms conclusions regarding them and in the case of constructive imagination recombines them in effective forms and arrangement the intellect is the last in order of the course of mental evolution it appears last in order in the mind of the child but it often persists in old age after the feelings have grown dim and the memory weak concepts what is known as the concept is the first fruit of the elemental processes of thought the various images of outside objects are sensed then perceived and then grouped according to their likenesses and differences and the result is the production of concepts it is difficult to define a concept so as to convey any meaning to the beginner for instance the dictionaries give the definition as an abstract general conception idea or notion formed in the mind not very clear this is it perhaps we can understand it better if we say that the terms dog cat man horse house etc each expresses a concept every term expresses a concept every general name of a thing or quality is a term applied to the concept we shall see this a little clearer as we proceed we form a concept in this way one we perceive a number of things two then we notice certain qualities possessed by things certain properties attributes or characteristics which make the thing what it is three then we compare these qualities of the thing with the qualities of other things and see that there is a likeness in some cases in various degrees and a difference in other cases in various degrees four then we generalize or classify the perceived things according to their ascertained likenesses and differences five then we form a general idea or concept embodying each class of thing and finally we give to the concept a term or name which is its symbol the concept is a general idea of a class of things the term is the expression of that general idea the concept is the idea of a class of things the term is the label affixed to the thing to illustrate this last distinction let us take the concept and term of bird for instance by perception comparison and classification of the qualities of living things we have arrived at the conclusion that there exists a great general class the qualities of which may be stated thus warm-blooded feathered winged oviparous vertebrate to this general class of quality possessing animals we apply the english term bird the name is merely a symbol in german the term is vogel in latin avis but in each and every case the general idea or concept above stated that is warm-blooded feathered winged oviparous vertebrate is meant if anything is found having all those particular qualities then we know it must be what we call a bird and everything we call a bird must have those qualities the term bird is the symbol for that particular combination of qualities existing in a thing there is a difference between a mental image of the imagination and a concept the mental image must always be of a particular thing while a concept is always an idea of a general class of things which cannot be clearly pictured in the mind for instance the imagination may form the mental picture of any known bird or even of an imaginary bird but that bird always will be a distinct particular bird 
Try to form a mental image of a general class of birds. How would you do it? Do you realize the difficulty? First, such an image would have to include the characteristics of the large birds, such as the eagle, ostrich, and condor, and of the small birds, such as the wren and hummingbird. It must be a composite of the shape of all birds, from the ostrich, swan, eagle, crane, down to the sparrow, swallow, and hummingbird. It must picture the particular qualities of birds of prey, water birds, and domestic fowls, as well as the grain eaters. It must exhibit all the colours found in bird life, from the brightest reds and greens, down to the sober greys and browns. A little thought will show that a clear mental image of such a concept is impossible. What the most of us do, when we think of bird, is to picture a vague, flying shape of dull colour. But when we stop to think that the term must also include the waddling duck and the scratching barnyard chicken, we see that our mental image is faulty. The trouble is that the term bird really means all bird, and we cannot picture an all bird from the very nature of the case. Our terms, therefore, are like mathematical figures or algebraic symbols, which we use for ease, speed, and clearness of thinking. The trouble does not end here. Concepts not only include the general idea of things, but also the general idea of the qualities of things. Thus, sweetness, hardness, courage, and energy are concepts, but we cannot form a mental image of them by themselves. We may picture a sweet thing, but not sweetness itself. So you see that a concept is a purely abstract mental idea, a symbol, akin to the figures one, two, three, etc., and used in the same way. They stand for general classes of things. A term is the verbal and written expression of the general idea or concept. The student is requested to fix these distinctions in his mind, so as to render future understanding of them easy. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 Conception the idea of conception has been well defined by Gordy as that act of mind by which it forms an idea of a class, or that act of the mind which enables us to use general names intelligently. He adds, It is, of course, understood that I am using the word class to denote an indefinite number of individuals that resemble each other in certain particulars. Perception the first step in conception, as we have seen, is that of perception. It is readily perceived that the character of our intellectual processes depends materially upon the variety, clearness, and accuracy of our perceptions. Therefore, again, we would refer our students to the chapter in which we have stated the importance of clear perception. Memory the future steps of conception depend materially upon the clearness of the memory, as we can classify objects only by remembering their qualities beyond the immediate moment of actual original perception. Therefore, the memory should be strengthened for this, as well as other objects. Abstraction The second step in conception is that of the mental abstraction of qualities from the observed thing. That is, we must perceive and then mentally set aside the observed qualities of the thing. For instance, man first perceived the existence of certain qualities in things. He found that a certain number of things possessed some of these qualities in common, while others possessed other qualities in the same way, and thus arose classification from comparison. But both comparison and classification are possible only by abstraction, or the perception of the quality as a thing. Thus, the abstraction of the idea of the quality of sweetness from the idea of sugar. Sweetness is a quality rather than a thing itself. It is something possessed by sugar which helps to make sugar what it is. Colour, shape, size, mental qualities, habits of action. These are some of the qualities first observed in things and abstracted from them in thought. Redness, sweetness, hardness, softness, largeness, smallness, fragrance, swiftness, slowness, fierceness, gentleness, warmness, coldness, etc. These are abstracted qualities of things. 
Of course, these qualities are never really divorced from things, but the mind divorces them in order to make thinking easier. An authority says, Animals are incapable of making abstractions, and that is the reason why they cannot develop formal thought. Abstract thought is identical with rational thought, which is the characteristic feature of the thought of speaking beings. This is the reason why abstract thought is upon earth the exclusive property of man, and why brutes are incapable of abstract thought. The process of naming is the mechanism of abstraction, for names establish the mental independence of the objects named. The processes of abstraction depend upon attention, concentrated attention. Attention directed to the qualities of a thing tends to abstract the qualities in thought from the thing itself. Mill says, abstraction is primarily the result of attention. Hamilton says, attention and abstraction are only the same process viewed in different relations. Cultivation of the power of abstraction means principally cultivation of attention. Any mental activity which tends towards analysis or separation of a thing into its parts, qualities, or elements, will serve to cultivate and develop the power of abstraction. The habit of converting qualities into concepts is acquired by transforming adjective terms into their corresponding noun terms. For instance, a piece of coloured candy possesses the qualities of being round, hard, red, sweet, etc. Transforming these adjective qualities into noun terms we have the concepts of roundness, hardness, redness, and sweetness, respectively. Comparison The third step in conception is that of comparison, in which the qualities of several things are compared or examined for likenesses and differences. We find many qualities in which several things differ, and a few in which there is a likeness. Classes are formed from resemblances or likenesses, while individuals are separated from apparent classes by detection of differences. Finally, it is found that separate things, while having many points of difference which indicate their individuality, nevertheless have a few points of likeness which indicate that they belong to the same general family or class. The detection of likenesses and differences in the qualities of various things is an important mental process. Many of the higher thought processes depend largely upon the ability to compare things properly. The development of attention and perception tends to develop the power of comparison. Classification or generalization The fourth step in conception is that of classification or generalization, whereby we place individual things in a mental bundle or class, and then this bundle in company with other bundles into a higher class and so on. Thus we group all the individual small birds, having certain characteristics, into a species, then several related species into a larger family, and this into a still larger, until we finally group all the bird families into the great concept which we call birds, and of which the simple term bird expresses the general concept. Jevons says, we classify things together whenever we observe that they are like each other in any respect, and therefore think of them together. In classifying a collection of objects, we do not merely put together into groups those which resemble each other, but we also divide each class into smaller ones in which the resemblance is more complete. Thus the class of white substances may be divided into those which are solid and those which are fluid, so that we get the two minor classes of solid white and fluid white. It is desirable to have names by which to show that one class is contained in another, and accordingly we call the class which is divided into two or more smaller species the genus, and the smaller ones into which it is divided the species. Every species is a small family of the individuals composing it, and at the same time is an individual species of the genus just above it. The genus, in turn, is a family of several species, and at the same time an individual genus in the greater family or genus above it. The student may familiarize himself with the idea of generalization by considering himself as an individual, John Smith. John represents that unit of generalization. 
the next step is to combine John with the other Smiths of his immediate family. Then this family may be grouped with his near blood relations, and so on, until finally all the related Smiths, near and remote, are grouped together in a great Smith family. Or, in the same way, the family group may be enlarged until it takes in all the white people in a county, then all the white people in the state, then all in the United States, then all the white races, then all the white and other light-skinned races, then all mankind. Then, if one is inclined, the process may be continued until it embraces every living creature from monoron to man. Reversing the process, living creatures may be divided and subdivided until all mankind is seen to stand as a class. Then the race of man may be divided into sub-races according to colour, then the white race may be subdivided into Americans and non-Americans, then the Americans may be divided into the inhabitants of the several states, or into Indianans or non-Indianans, then into the inhabitants of the several counties of Indiana, and thus the Posey Countians are reached. Then the Posey County people are divided into Smiths and non-Smiths, then the Smith family into its constituent family groups, and then into the smaller families, and so on, until the classification reaches one particular John Smith, who at last is found to be an individual, in a class by himself. This is the story of the ascending and descending processes of generalization. End of chapter 21 End of section 9